hearts today and we say, Spirit of God, move. We approach your word in humility, recognizing your word is a living thing, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the division of soul and spirits, joints and marrow. And therefore, we approach your word with humility, Lord, and we say, Spirit of God, speak to us today. And all the people said, Amen. Hallelujah. We're just continuing our series today called The Secret Place. And um, most likely, I think it's probably going to be a three-part series. And, um, but I believe it's going to bless you. So anyway, The Secret Place. Let me just start by telling a story. Um, an, an Amish family were visiting New York City for the first time. It was their first time visiting a big city. Fact is, it was their, they'd never even visited a large town before. They were fascinated at the crowds, the cars, even the traffic lights. And they were particularly fascinated by the skyscrapers. They walked into the Empire State Building, and as they were standing in the lobby, they were amazed by looking at these uh, silver metal doors that opened and closed by themselves. And while the father and son were watching wide-eyed at these doors, an old lady walked up to the doors, pressed the button, and a few moments later, the doors opened and she walked into a small room and the doors closed again. And they watched as little lights above these doors began to light up in an upward direction and then they stopped. And then they began to light in a downward direction and a few, minutes, a few moments later, the doors opened, and this beautiful 24-year-old woman walks out. And the father turns to his son, he says, go get your mother quickly. <laughs> and you know, if we were to be honest, most people are unhappy with some aspects of their lives. And clearly, others are unhappy with certain aspects of others' lives. But I guess that's a different story, but... Again, whether it's our weight, our, our appearance, or the size of our nose, or the angle of our ears, uh, or our height, you know, everyone, if they had ability, if they had the ability, would probably change something about themselves. How many of you would immediately, if you had the power, change one thing about yourself this morning? How many of you would change something about your spot? Don't, no, <laughs> we're not going there. Uh, we don't have enough time. Um, but you know what? In light of this almost universal sense of dissatisfaction among mankind, you know, this explains why many celebrities who have more money than sense, um, you know, try, but usually in vain, to change the lot that nature gave them. But really, all this is, I believe, is simply a reflection of, of, of man's longing to experience true change. And, you know, we're going to see it as the New Year's um, approaches. Everybody's going to start making all sorts of resolutions that they have no intention in keeping, um, or at least no ability to keep. But really what it is, it's a reflection of the fact that people truly desire to experience real change. But again, while you can join a gym or get a makeover or, you know, get, get a complete new wardrobe or even, you know, uh, go, go through some plastic surgery in the hope of finding that elusive happiness, you know, while you might find some temporary satisfaction, it generally doesn't last long. You know, the new car loses that new car smell and gets dented and filled with old McDonald's cartons. You know, the phone gets uh, outdated. You know, the clothes go out of style. Your spouse, well, you're stuck with them. But, um, but you know, ultimately, nothing will change your life like coming into God's presence. Nothing will change your life because you are created to walk with God. Amen? Because many times, this is the reality, while we're unhappy with our outward circumstances, in many instances, our dissatisfaction is rooted in an inward emptiness. 
And this is why, you know, we blame our spouse, our kids, um, our, our job, our, our neighbors, the traffic. But in reality, the reason why we are unhappy is not because of what's going on around us, because ultimately that's just called life, but rather what's missing in us. This is why many people are unhappy, like I said, is, is not what's going on around you, but rather what's going on in you. Amen? So again, what's missing is that we have missed a vital invitation. That's what people are missing. I know some people think, no, uh, my problem is money, or no, my problem is my wife, or, or it's my kids that are driving me crazy, or if I could get a better job, or if I could move home, I'd be happy. No, no, you wouldn't. You might get some temporary satisfaction, but again, what's, what's missing on the inside of people is that we have ignored a vital invitation. Amen. You know, it amazes me as a pastor, you know, the people will literally walk over each other, you know, just to get around somebody important. And yet each of us have a personal invitation from the creator of the universe to come into his presence. And you know, the best thing about this is you don't have to make an appointment. Amen? You, you don't have to name drop or you don't have to push your way in. Fact is, he's ready when you are. And that is the beautiful thing. God is ready when you are. And this is why Jesus said in Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28, Come to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn of me, for I am humble and gentle in heart, and you will find rest for your souls, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light. You see, Jesus says, come. God has given us an invitation. And sadly, so many times I see believers desperately trying to get around somebody they perceive to be important when the reality is God has invited you to come to him. And that's the essential import of this message is God has invited us into the secret place and there is nowhere that compares to, to being in God's presence. You see, because for God, it was never about religion. And I appreciate in Ireland, we had, we've had, we had religion coming out our ears. Fact is, if religion could have solved the problems of the world, we would have never had the troubles in Northern Ireland. But you see, for God, it was never about religion. It was always about relationship. God has called you, and that's why it's not a sufficient answer when we ask you where you're going to spend eternity to say I'm Catholic, or say I'm Protestant, or Baptist, or Pentecostal, or anything else. That's simply a label, and you can put any label you want on an empty bottle. It doesn't change the fact that it's empty. I'm asking, do you have a relationship with the living God? Do you walk with Him? Do you talk with Him? Do you hear His voice? Do you know Him? Not do you know about him. People knew about God and still they planted bombs in Northern Ireland, killing innocent men, women, and children in the name of a perverted cause. It didn't bring freedom to this nation then and it won't bring freedom to this nation now. Freedom is not found in a cause or an ideology. It is found in Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior. And he said, come, come all you who are weary and I will give you rest. What a beautiful thing to think that God cares about us, that God wants us to know him. You know, last week we looked at how the secret place is a private place. If you could try and get rid of the, thank you on the sound, thank you. We, we looked last week at how the secret place is a private place place. That's Jesus said in Matthew um, chapter 5, close the door. So we, 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 you know, it's so important. This is why we need to turn off our phone, get rid of the distractions, okay, and give God our full attention. You know, fact is, some of you can't pray for five minutes without checking on your social media. Let me tell you this, the Kardashians will be fine. Don't worry about them. Just give God your attention. 
It's so important, amen? So again, it's a private place. Matthew chapter 14, 21. About 5,000 men were fed in addition to women and children. Immediately, Jesus made the disciples get into the boat and go on ahead of him to the other side while he dismissed the crowds. Just like Pastor Joanna said, it's not about the crowds. Sometimes we get more excited about the crowds than we do about his presence. You know, praise God for when this place is full. But you know what? It's so important to understand that it's about his presence. And it said, after he had sent them away, he went up in the mountain by himself to pray. When evening came, he was there alone. You see, a true man or woman of God doesn't live for the cheers of the crowd, but rather for the presence of the Father. And this is why we must learn to treasure the presence of God in our lives. Matthew chapter 6 and verse 30. The disciples returned to Jesus from their ministry and told them all that had been done and taught. Then Jesus said, let's go off by ourselves to a quiet place and rest a while. He said this because there were so many people coming and going that Jesus and his apostles didn't even have time to eat. So they left the boat for a quiet place where they could be alone. And this is the thing that strikes me is that, you know, if even Jesus himself and the 12 disciples needed to get away from the crowds and recharge in God's presence, how much more do we? Again, it may be a bedroom or, or a study or, you know, even just go for a walk and, and, and talk to the Lord. But you need to get alone with God and his glorious presence will literally transform your life. Like I said, you know, it, it really doesn't matter where you go to meet him. Um, like, like I said last week, for me, when I was in college, my first year, I used to meet God in, in a dark alley behind my flat. So again, God will meet you where you're at, amen? So um, secondly, we looked at how the secret place is a sacred place. Um, you know, we looked at how God, could somebody sort this out, please? I appreciate that, thank you. Um, it, it's, it's a secret place. God it showed us, it's not just a secret place, uh, it's not just a private place, it's a sacred place. So God, presence is a holy presence. And um, so we looked at how God is restoring to his church a sense of reverence for his presence. Okay, because if we don't have that sense of reverence for his presence, then, you know, nothing, nothing is going to work. God wants to restore that sense of his awesome majesty. The book of Hebrews chapter 10 says, Therefore, brethren, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, like the old charismatic song goes, we truly are a privileged people. Our privilege is not based on color or our economic circumstances. Our privilege is based on the fact that we can come into the presence of the creator of the universe. So the third one is this, and this is what I want to deal with today, is it is a repentant place. Exodus chapter 3 and verse 5. Then he said, do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet, for the place on which you are standing is holy ground. It is holy ground. I appreciate that, you know, many times during the week that there's boxing matches going on here. But let me tell you something. Sunday morning, this place becomes holy ground. Because where God goes, that, that place becomes holy. When Christ comes into your heart, you become holy unto him. That's why he says, be holy, because I, the Lord your God, am holy. And here God says to Moses... Do not come near here. Remove your sandals from your feet for the place in which you're standing is holy ground. It wasn't holy because there was a grotto or a statue or some dead uh, smelly relic. It was holy because God's presence was there. Do you value God's presence in your life? 
Because if you do, you will come to a pace of repentance. I believe in these end days, you know, people are not just going to come to church. They're going to come to Christ and everything will be different. And you know, let me say this, men and women are not going to be sitting there like the two old guys from the Muppets sitting back and critiquing everything that happens. Let me say as a pastor, there are aspects of the word of faith that I don't identify with. There are excesses that were involved in that movement as there were with every movement. Okay? So, but, but you know what? I've been tremendously blessed by the teachings of Kenneth Hagin down through the years. Okay? But like I said, while there are things that I don't identify with, you know, in that, if all you do is spend your week online listening to Reformed theology and people like John McCart and all these others who deny the gifts of the Spirit and healing and miracles, etc. If that's all you feed on, you're not going to be happy here. You're just going to be sitting there mad all the time. And so I think it's important. Let me just clarify. This is a Spirit-filled church. We believe, we embrace the, the gifts of the Spirit. We embrace the baptism of the Holy Spirit. We believe miracles are for today. Jesus Christ, the same yesterday, today, and forever. Okay? So I think it's important. That, and you know what? We believe in prosperity. We believe God cares about your needs. I'm not sure why that is so contentious or controversial. I'm a father. I'm not glorified if my little girl is walking around in rags. Why do you think that God wants you poor, broke, miserable, and sick that you somehow glorify him? And let me tell you something. As a pastor, it takes money to preach the gospel. Really, I think the reason some people embrace that whole ideology is because they are stingy. There you go. I want to see revival in this nation. You know, I was out Friday night preaching on the street. And you know what? Some of the people walking by looked at me like I was out of my mind. And you know, I just felt so sorry for the people. Because the Bible says the God of this age has blinded the eyes of those who don't believe. They're looking at me like I'm a lunatic. And they're not ready to face eternity. Let me say this. God is moving. And I'm not going to be spending my time explaining the vision to those who want to enforce theirs. Let me say, God put me here as the pastor. God gave me a very clear vision of what we're called to do, where we're called to go. If you feel to join with that vision, great. But if you try and push a different vision, that's die vision. And that's the work of the enemy. Okay? So, you know what? Like I said, I'm not going to be walking around on eggshells worrying if I've offended you because you have issues with what we believe. We believe the Bible. We believe miracles are still for today. We believe healing is still for today. We believe God cares about your needs today. We don't just, you know, preach about a God who will, you know, do it'll be great in heaven. There'll be no sickness, there'll be no poverty, there'll be no works to the devil in heaven, but you have to go through hell on this earth. I don't believe that. Jesus said, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. So if there's no sickness in heaven, God doesn't want any sickness on you and this earth. Thank you, Jesus. Amos, and let me say this, you know, people were getting offended because, you know, nearly 700 people answered the altar call. We know that many of them were not, were not uh, unsaved. We understand that. The altar call was given for people who were unsaved, people who were falling away from God, and people who wanted to, to recommit their lives and, and receive the fire. So again, you know, Christians get so, like I said, it's just like the two, uh, maybe you've never seen the Muppets, but there was these two old guys in the balcony, and they would just sit back and just criticize everything, because they were just full of cynicism and negativity. Don't be like that. You know, if you're counting... If you're counting the people at the altar call, you're in the flesh. If people are, 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 are responding, 
out of a hunger for God and, and, and God is touching them and you're sitting there counting so you can somehow, you know, quote a figure there, oh, this many people, that's the flesh. But if you're sitting there judging the intentions of the people that are up there saying they're fake salvations, you're in the flesh as well. You know what amazes me as a pastor that God can be moving and people completely miss what God is doing because they're in the flesh. Amos 3 verse 3 says, can two people walk together without agreeing on the direction? As a pastor, like I said, I know where I'm going. And you know, let me say this. I'm going there with or without you. Okay? Because God put it on my heart. He gave Joanna myself a vision many years ago. And you know what? We're going to press forward into that vision to see it come to pass. Because you know what? I desire to see Dublin shaken by the power of God. Thank you for that one clap. I want to see Dublin. Now, again, you might be happy spending your time studying the answers to questions that nobody else is asking. But as for me, I'm tired of seeing people live in misery and die in sin. It's time for change in Ireland. Amen? I want to see revival, but to do that, we have to be open to change. And more than anything else, we have to be delivered from the spirit of religion. You know, religion has kept this nation bound for 2,000 years. And it's time for the people of God to be set free in the name of Jesus. Religion doesn't save. Jesus saves. If religion could have solved the problem, Ireland would have been great. It wasn't. You know, many people in Ireland have, have unfortunately thrown out the baby with the bathwater because they've rejected religion rightfully. But you know what? Jesus never came. He said, I've come that you would have life and have it more abundantly. Jesus came that we would have a relationship, not that we would have a religion. And this is why if we want to enter into the secret place, it starts with repentance. We have to be open to change. You know, I believe the time, you may laugh, but i tell you something. I believe the time is going to come very soon when you're going to have to come early if you want to get a seat. Amen? Because people are, are going to be hungry. You know, we're going to see an awakening in this nation. We're going to see a spiritual awakening in this land. And we're going to see a new level of hunger and conviction among God's people. Where people are so desperate to see God move, they stop drawing these boundaries. They stop, you know, where we get so hungry for, for, for God and for Him to move that we stop giving Him terms on how He can move. Oh, I was offended. Uh, those people laughing. God, I, I'm so tired of that religious spirit. What is wrong with people laughing? I, I've seen so many people depressed and in despair and taking tablets. You know, God wants to set people free. Okay, so anyway, God, God wants us to adjust our hearts. And that's all that repentance is. It's about us adjusting our hearts for God. I believe we're going to see people weeping again. We're going to see people laughing again. We're going to see God's word piercing the hearts of people again. Because, you know, there's going to be a new fear of God and a true repentance and reverence for his presence. You know, there's going to be a new realm of God's glory as we worship him. You know, we're, we're going to sense his presence in, in a new way. But the first thing that happens when you come into God's presence is he convicts you. He convicts you of, of your sin. He convicts you of areas where you need to change. Because let me say this. God does not change. And because he doesn't change, you have to. Some, some of you are trying to make God change. He's not going to change. He's not going to adjust his principles or his word or his standards to accommodate you. Amazingly. I, the Lord, do not change. Book of Malachi. Because God doesn't change, this is why we have to. 
John 16, 8, when the Spirit comes, He will convict the world concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. You see, the Holy Spirit convicts the world of the sin of unbelief and He brings us to Christ, but His work doesn't stop there. Amen? He, you know, he, he brings us to a place of repentance from dead works. You know, Hebrews chapter 6 talks about this. Thank you, Lord. I need to get the sound sorted. John chapter 16, verse 8. When the Spirit comes, He'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. And Hebrews 6, therefore leaving the discussion of the elementary principles of Christ, let us go on to perfection, not laying again the foundation of repentance from dead works and of faith towards God. You might say today, I don't feel the presence of God in my life anymore. Well, go back to the last thing that God told you to do and do it. That's what repentance means. Repentance isn't about tears. It's not about feelings or emotions or goosebumps or feeling angels' wings. Repentance is about making concrete changes in your life. When God says stop doing that, you stop it. Repentance from dead works. Just like a tree with dead branches that have to be pruned and removed to be fruitful. So the Holy Spirit convicts us of the things that grieve Him. Amen? Ephesians 4.30 <clears throat> Do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God with whom you are sealed for the day of redemption. You know, when in spite of God's gentle promptings, we insist on persisting with some sinful habit, willfully disobeying Him by our lifestyle or our habits, our associations, uh, holding on to unforgiveness or our bitterness, etc., what we're actually doing is we're actively resisting the Spirit and we're grieving Him. You know, you can speak words about another person that grieve the Holy Spirit. You know, the Bible says, believe the best of every person. If somebody wants to come and whisper in your ear and get you to gossip, you need to say, you know what? My ears are not dustbin lids. You need to guard your heart. You can be, because you can be speaking words that grieve the Spirit. You can be listening to words. Have you ever had somebody talk to you and you just go away and you feel dirty or you feel condemned. You know why? Because you just listened to a conversation you'd no business listening to at all. So when a person starts in that vein, say, just put your hand up, say, sorry, you're talking to the wrong person. I don't want to get involved in that. Amen. Gossip has no place in the body of Christ. But you know, thank God that even when we do mess up or when we miss His will, that we can repent. And that, you know, repent simply means to change your direction. It means to turn around. It means to turn from sin. But it also means not just to turn from something, it means to turn to something. So we turn from, some, we turn from sin, but we turn to God. 1 John 1, 9, if we confess our sin, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And this is the glorious thing. We turn from sin in the secret place. This is why maybe some of you are still struggling with things years later is because all you do is you bring a list of requests into God. But you must come into the secret place, not just with the desire to speak, but with the desire to listen. And this is why I believe this was meant to be a one-week message. God has it, uh, he's put on my heart that it's to be three because I think it's something that we need to take time because there needs to be an adjustment made in every one of our hearts. If you want to know God, if, if you want to walk with God, then I believe this, this, this is absolutely key. The secret place has to become a lifestyle. And as you know, change takes time. Just going to the gym one time doesn't change you. It is a process of weeks and months and even years. But I believe this, this series is part of that process of change in our lives in Jesus' name. You see, we turn from sin in the secret place. It's in the secret place that we leave behind the dead things from the past. You know, those things, like I said, that held us bound. You know, all the things that try to define and destroy us. You know, whether lust or fear or depression or anger or torment. It's in the secret place that we leave those things behind us. Hebrews 11 verse 39. It says, quenched the fury of the flames and escaped the edge of the sword. 
whose weakness was turned to strength and who became powerful in battle and routed foreign armies. You know, don't give up. You know, God isn't finished with you. He will make you powerful in prayer if you permit him. You know, God will cause your enemies to flee before you. You know, your enemy today might be addiction or depression or anxiety or confusion or fear or debt. You know, but know this, God has a plan for you. He has a purpose and his purpose for you will prevail. It's important to understand because, you know, Genesis 32, 28, and he said, your, your name shall be called no more Jacob, but Israel. For as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed. So here God speaks to, jo to Jacob and um, he says, you know, your name is going to be changed from Jacob to Israel because as a prince, you have power with God and with men and have prevailed. You see, and that power isn't found in oratory or ability or, or getting around the right people. And let me say this, you, you may be bored this morning. I don't care. This is absolutely vital. If, this, if you don't have this right in your life, nothing else will work. Amen? Hallelujah. You know, if this, the secret place of the Most High, we're not going to see revival until the people of God become passionate about prayer. You know why they see revival in Africa and parts of South America? People are passionate about His presence. See, if all you did today is come here to hear a little message, that's not what it's about. This series is about you coming into God's presence and developing that place where you walk in the secret place. He who dwells in the secret place. Do you know what dwell means? It means to live. See, so many of us, we only come to the secret place when we're in trouble. He who dwells. Every one of you today are going to go back to your home at some stage. This, this secret place, the presence of God is to be our home. Okay? So again... Do you have a humble, repentant heart that is hungry for God? You know, James 4, 6, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Thank you, Jesus. God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. Again, God's grace will be extended towards you if you're humble. But again, this is why we repent. This is why we turn from the sin in our lives. We turn from the things that grieve the Holy Spirit of God. You know, Acts chapter 3 and verse 19, Peter here is talking, but <clears throat> thank you, Jesus. It says, repent, therefore, the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Amen. Repent, therefore, and be converted, that your sins may be blotted out, so the times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. You know, times of refreshing are preceded by times of repentance. And again, this may be while you are weary in your life and you don't understand why. You are weary because you haven't repented. You are weary because there are issues in your life that God has a problem with. You might be comfortable with them, but God isn't. The Holy Spirit is not comfortable with sin in your life. This is why we have to get our hearts right with God. Amen. We come before God safe in the knowledge that he is right and we are wrong. You know, Hosea chapter 10 and verse 12 addresses this. And it says, sow for yourselves righteousness, reap in mercy, break up your fallow ground for it is time to seek the Lord till he comes and rains righteousness on you. Break up your fallow ground. It's interesting that God doesn't say, point your finger. You know, in the, in, the, in the months coming up to this, I was shocked at the amount of Christians, the venom and the vitriol coming out of their mouth, condemning us for having uh, this pastor here. L let me say this. The Bible says a lot about if we would judge ourselves. You know, it's a dangerous place to set yourself up as judge and jury over another man or woman of God. The Bible says judge yourself. You judge yourself. It's important. And this is why when it talks about revival, it says break up your fallow ground. Do you know what fallow ground is? 
That's a field that's been left for a number of years and it hasn't been plowed. And over the, over the subsequent winters, that ground gets hard, almost like concrete. And that's why the plow has to be driven through that hard ground. You could spread seed all over that field and you will not get a harvest because all it will do is sit on the top of the soil. That hard soil has to be broken up. And that's what the Word of God is doing this morning. I know I appreciate there's some messages where everybody's, Hallelujah, glory to Jesus, waving and laughing and praising God. But you know what? We should be praising God with this as well. Because you know what? Before the seed can go into the ground, the ground has to be broken up. And if we are serious about seeing revival, the hardness in our heart has to be broken up as well. Break up your fallow ground. It is time to seek the Lord. God is saying that to every one of us today. It is time to seek the Lord. It is time to seek His face. Thank you, Jesus. 2 Samuel 12 and verse 5. And David said to Nathan, as the Lord lives, the man that has done this thing shall surely die because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Because he had no pity. And Nathan said to David, Thou art the man. You know, God has convicted me. We have to be so careful about the words that come out of our mouth. Because the time will come that we will stand before the creator of the universe. And I don't want to be standing before God with some some sense of self-righteousness. And God says, thou art the man, or thou art the woman. You're judging others and you haven't judged yourself. You're criticizing and condemning others, and instead of praying for them, you're judging them and talking about them and setting yourself up as if you somehow are their judge. Let me say this, you are not another person's judge. The Bible says, as every knee shall bow, every tongue confess, we will all bow before the Lord. And it is so important that we come to a place of humility and repent of this arrogance and pride that causes us to be constantly judging of others and talking about others, talking behind their back. It's not godly and it grieves the Holy Spirit. You see, repentance isn't about guilt or legalism or or endlessly rehearsing the mistakes of the past. It's not about going back over the past, but rather it's about going forward. Let me tell you this. You will not go forward in your life until there are some core issues that you repent of. You know what they are. God knows what they are. And the devil knows what they are. This is not about pointing your fingers at anybody. This message is to myself as well as to anybody else. But you see, Nathan was David's friend, not his enemy, by calling him to repentance. You see, the sobering reality is that all of us have a tendency to be blind to our own faults. Okay, Proverbs 22, verse 17, as iron sharpens iron, so one person sharpens another. This is why we need to surround ourselves with people who fear God and who inspire us to serve Him. You know, David was only confronted in the public place because he refused to repent in the private place. And let me say, if there are issues that you refuse to repent of in private, the time will come when God will deal with it in public. And this is why it's so important that we maintain a close relationship with the Lord where every day we come into the secret place, where we come before God, not in arrogance, but in humility. You know, Psalm 51 records that, you know, how David's, you know, words of repentance. And it's a beautiful Psalm because, you know, in this Psalm, David pours his heart out to God. David was far from perfect, but he, you know, he acknowledged, verse 4, Against you, you only have I sinned and done this evil in your sight, that you may be found just when you speak and blameless when you're judged. The one thing David did right was he acknowledged, you know what, Lord, I'm guilty and I repent. I turn from it. Amen. And he said, Behold, you desire truth in the inward parts. If you're so busy judging everybody else, you have no time to judge yourself. David fell, but again, it's not always about how you fall, but about how you get back up again. 
You know, in the secret place, we discover that the past no longer has power to determine our future. You know, in the secret place, we hear the voice of the Father calling us back to Him. This is why the enemy attacks your prayer life. You know, it's a principle of, you know, uh, you, you know military um, strategy that the first thing you want to take out is the, uh, is the enemy's line of communication. And Satan wants to destroy your line of communication with God. You know, he doesn't care how busy you are or how much money you got in. Once you're too busy to spend some time in the secret place. It's just a matter of time before you get into trouble. You know, where was, where was Peter before he gave his very first sermon? You know, a sermon that was so powerful. And again, think about it. You know, true history. John Edwards, George Whitfield, George, uh, you know, John Wesley. All these great men and women of God who went before us and who delivered messages that, that spoke to God's people and inspired and convicted and blessed the people of God. Think about it. The very first sermon that was ever given was given by Peter on the day of Pentecost. Okay, and it was so powerful that 3,000 people responded to Jesus Christ. 3,000 people, the Bible says, were saved and were baptized on that day. But where was Peter before he gave that sermon? He was in the upper room. And where was Peter before he denied Jesus? He was asleep. I think there's a lesson there for every one of us. Some of you are asleep. You're, some of you are asleep and it's just a matter of time before you get into trouble because you are, you are neglecting time in the secret place. There is a principle. Peter was a changed man because he had been in the secret place. Peter fell, but just like David, he repented and God restored him. And that's why I love the gospel message because in the gospel, it clearly outlines God's holiness, God's standard, and how we all fall short, but it also shows us the answer. We look at the cross and we recognize there is an opportunity for us to turn from our sin. We can repent. We can turn. The cross is an eternal declaration to mankind that your present doesn't have to be your future. That you have an opportunity to embrace the grace of God. That you can repent from your sin. Amen. So, you know, again, it's in the secret place that our dreams come back to life. For Peter, the dream had died. He saw Jesus die and then he denied Christ three times. But he spent time in the secret place. And the very person who is the most disqualified, God pushes forward to give the very first sermon. You see, repentance is a beautiful thing because when we repent, heaven moves on our behalf. Amen. You see, God in his grace brings us into the secret place, not to condemn us or to lecture us or to, to you know, to, to limit us, but rather to love and bless and restore us. This message isn't about condemning anybody. This message is about restoration. Joel 2.25. And I will restore to you the years that the locust has eaten. The canker worm and the caterpillar and the palm worm and my great army which I sent amongst you. You see, God will bring restoration to your life if you let him. But you might say today, pastor, but I fell away from God. Well, today is a good day to fall back. Like Ronald Bonke, when people talk about backsliding, he says, well, slide back to Jesus. Amen. Amen. You see, God will search your heart. He will heal your soul. He will restore your life in the secret place. And if Ranga and Grace could come up, we're going to sing an ancient um, Irish hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Because you see, there, there is something about coming into the presence of God that changes everything. The Lord put this in my heart this morning. You know, Psalm 139, search me, God, and know my heart and test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there's any offensive way in me and lead me in the way of everlasting. You see, in the secret place, the Holy Spirit gently convicts us of areas of our lives where we need to change. 
Maybe it's someone we need to forgive, or maybe an adjustment in the way we speak or we react, or the way we speak to our children, or maybe some habits we need to let go of. As the ushers give out the elements, I think it'd be a beautiful thing for us to take communion, so you can just wait for, for a moment because we're going to sing um, uh, this ancient song. This, it's an ancient Irish hymn. It was written in the 6th century uh, by, by uh, uh, Donald. And um, he was a Christian poet, but it's, it's, uh, it, the word, it was translated into English in 1912. But you know what? It's a beautiful hymn because it reminds us that we need to put our eyes on the Lord Jesus Christ. We need to have a fresh vision of Him. Because let me tell you this, healing always follows repentance. So again, maybe the reason why you haven't been healed Maybe the reason why some issue in your life hasn't been healed is because you haven't truly repented. So could you stand to your feet? And we're just going to sing this beautiful hymn, Be Thou My Vision. Jesus, I am.
six days, Jesus took Peter, James, and John, his brother, led them up on a high mountain by themselves. And he was transfigured before them. His face shone like the sun, and his clothes became as white as the light. And behold, Moses and Elijah appeared to them, talking with them. Then Peter answered and said to Jesus, Lord, it is good for us to be here. If you wish, let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, and one for Elijah. While he was still speaking, behold, a bright cloud overshadowed them, and suddenly a voice came out of the cloud saying to them, This is my beloved Son in whom I am well pleased. Hear him. And when the disciples heard this, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. You know what happened? They repented. They repented of, of, of placing Jesus on the same level as mortal man. They, they, they repented of a lack of reverence, a lack of, of sensitivity to the moment. They repented of getting in the flesh, but it didn't stop there. You see, God convicts us not because He hates us, because He loves us. He convicts us not because He wants us to stay away, but because He wants us to come close. Just like Moses, the Bible says he saw God face to face. And God is inviting every one of us today into a deeper walk with him. But to do that, there are some things we have to let go today. Because there are some areas of your life where hell has a hold on your heart. Maybe you were abused or maybe you were hurt in the past, but you have to forgive Maybe you have some addiction in the background to alcohol or drugs or porn. That has to go today. God says, let it go. Just let it go. Because we see here in the following verse, the glorious thing that happens once we repent. Once we turn from those things that grieve Him. We are ushered into a deeper walk with Him because it says... And when the disciples heard it, they fell on their faces and were greatly afraid. But Jesus came and touched them and said, Arise, do not be afraid. When they lifted up their eyes, they saw no one but Jesus only. See, God wants us to come to the place where we're not putting people on a pedestal. We're not looking to this man or that woman or this person or this ministry or this or that. Where we come to the place where we say, just give me Jesus. It says they saw nobody when they lifted their eyes. They were no longer conscious of their sin. They were no longer conscious of their past. They were no longer conscious of where they had failed or fallen short. But rather, they saw Jesus only. And as we break bread today, let's do so with that desire. When we come to church, we say, Lord, I don't care. I don't care if I'm up in the pews shouting and jumping around or from on my knees weeping before you in conviction. Whatever it takes, Lord. Whatever it takes. I want to see you face to face. I want to know you. Is that the cry of your heart today? For I received from the Lord that which I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he's betrayed took bread. When he had broken it, he said, take this and eat. This is my body, which is broken for you. Do this in memory of me. Lord, as we, as we eat of the bread today, we're reminded that your body was broken so that we could be whole. We receive healing. And Lord, for those today, maybe... There's people who've been abused. There's people who've had heartbreak or people who've got physical sickness or disease. Lord, we speak healing over Winnie as she watches today in hospital. We declare that cancer is no power in the name of Jesus. We rebuke every sickness and disease in this place. And as we take of this broken bread, we're reminded of your body which was broken on the cross. And we declare healing is ours in Jesus' name. Thank you that by your stripes we were healed. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, this is the cup of the new covenant in my blood, shed for the remission of your sins. Do this in memory of me. Lord, as we look at this cup, we're reminded of the blood that you shed on the cross for our sin. No matter what we did, no matter where we failed or how we, 
how we fell short, Lord. We, we look at the cup and we're reminded that we have a covenant with the living God. That your blood was shed on that cross to purchase our soul from hell. And therefore today, Lord God, just as we have been forgiven, we too forgive. There's some people right now you need to forgive and you need to just release those people. You need to release those memories. I'm not saying what happened to you was right or that you deserved it. You're just simply saying you're refusing to let that thing determine your future or determine your destiny. We forgive as we have been forgiven. All bitterness, every grudge, all bitterness. The right, the right to be offended, we're giving that up. The right to judge others, where we're giving that up. Because our judgment was on the cross and so was theirs. If somebody is out of God's will or doing something, that's between them and God. He will deal with them. But it is not our place to stand as judge and jury over others when we're desperately in need of forgiveness ourselves. So today, as we look at the cup, we're reminded of the blood. That no matter how we have fallen, how we have failed, that there is forgiveness, that there is cleansing, that there is the opportunity for a new beginning. So Lord, we take up the cup and we thank you, Lord Jesus, that we are forgiven, that we have a covenant with God. And when they looked up, they saw no one but Jesus only. Could you just lift your hands to the Lord for one moment and just acknowledge Him? Just receive His healing. Just receive His forgiveness. Just receive His love. Some of you, all of your life, you've struggled. You've never felt like you were worthy of His love. Let me tell you something. You are loved by God right now, right where you are. Not because you are perfect, because Jesus is perfect. His love for you is perfect. His love for you is everlasting. Truly, I've loved you with an everlasting love. This is why He brings us to repentance because He wants to remove those things that keep us separated from Him because He wants us to know Him. He wants us to hear His voice. He wants us to have room for Him. Oh, Lord, we worship you today. We open our hearts and we say, Lord, do what you desire to do in this place. For one moment, with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to give you an opportunity. If you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior.